Hi guys, welcome back to Introduction to Kotlin. My name is Tensor. Today we're going to be talking about control flow in Kotlin. Control flow is the ability for us to manage the flow of our program. So we can add branches to our program, we can have our program loop around, we can have it jump around, and we can do all kinds of different things. The most basic expression that we get with Kotlin is the if expression. Now in Kotlin, if is an expression that returns a value. In other words, if branches can be blocks and the last expression is the value of a block. If we look at our max function here, this takes in two values, both of which are integers, and it outputs an integer. And we have this return statement that appears before our if else block. So in other words, we're returning this entire block from this function, but this is not a problem because this block will evaluate to either one integer or another integer before that happens. In our case, a is one and b is 10. We check to see if this is true first, and if it is true, then we're going to return the last line of this first block. Otherwise, we're going to return the last line of this second block. And of course, because they only have one line, we're going to return a or b. We're going to return b because it's 10 and this is false. Therefore, b is the greater of the two numbers. If we run this program, you can see that we do in fact get 10 because 10 is the greater number here. Now we can continue to chain if statements together. Even after we say else, we can say another if. For instance, if we want to check to see if a equals b, and if they do, then we'll return zero. Now this is of course not the most efficient way to do this, but it is a way to do it. So if you want to, you can chain infinite if else statements together like this. So basically the way this will work is first it'll check to see if this is true. If it's not, then it will go to the next branch. It'll check to see if this is true. And if it's not, then it will go to the last branch. So this will still evaluate to the last branch, which will be B, which will be 10. Now keep in mind that if can either be a statement or an expression. Statement being a just a statement of fact, whereas an expression is something that actually has a implicit return value. If you're going to be using if as a statement, then you do not need an else branch. However, if you are going to be using it as an expression, then you do need an else branch. So in other words, if we remove both these else branches, you'll see here that we get an error because we're using this as an expression. And the reason we get this error is because if this becomes false, then we're returning something that is essentially null and Kotlin tries its best to avoid null. So that's just something to keep in mind. In Kotlin, rather than having a switch operator, we have what is called a when expression. When matches its argument against all branches subsequently until some branch condition is satisfied and can be used either as an expression or a statement. Like if, when can be used either as an expression or a statement. If it's used as an expression, the value of the satisfied branch becomes the value of the overall expression. If it's used as a statement, the values of the individual branches are ignored. So this is just like with our if else statement. So the else branch, this bottom branch, is evaluated if none of the other branch conditionals are satisfied. So in our case, what we're doing is we're iterating through our array here, and we're going to pull out each of these items, and we're going to then run them through our when block. And we're going to check the type of each of these elements. So if the type is an integer, then it will print out is int. If the type is a float, it'll print out float. If it's a double, then it'll print out double. If it's a string, it'll print out string. And if it's a boolean, it'll print out boolean. And if it's none of these things, then it'll hit this else statement, which will print out is a null question mark because we don't really know what it is. And you can see here that for our first element, because it's an integer, it prints out integer. Our second number is a double or a float. So it actually matches with double first. Then our third number is a float. So it matches with float. Our fourth element is a string. So it matches with string and our fifth element element is a boolean, so it matches with boolean. We can combine cases together. So for instance, I've combined is float and is double together, and this will just print out is double. So it'll print out is double slash float. And this can be useful for various things. So also all of these branches here can either be actual conditionals or they can be constants or constraints of any kind. So they can even be functions too. So we could have something set up like this. So we have two arrays. One has just 35 inside of it. And the other one is all numbers. So 1, 2, 19, 20, 14, 35, and 45. And then we're iterating through our larger array here. And we're checking to see whether or not these elements are inside of a range. So we want to see if they're inside between 1 and 10. Or if they're inside of our valid number array. In other words, if they're equal to 35. Or if they're not inside of the range 10 to 20. So if they don't match with this branch or this branch and they're not inside of this branch, 
then this will print out. Otherwise, they'll hit the else branch. For the first two, we get X's in the range, so this branch. Then for the next three, we get the else branch. Then for the last two, we get X is valid, and then we get X is outside of the range. So the reason why 45 matches with this and why 19, 20, and 14 match with this is because 19, 20, and 14 all exist between 10 and 20. So they don't match with this branch here, whereas 45 is not between these two ranges, therefore it does match with this branch. So when can also be used as a replacement for if else, if chain, and like mentioned before, when is an expression, so we can use it to assign to a variable. All right, so we've been using for loops, so now let's talk about for loops. So with for loops, we can iterate through collections, or we can iterate through ranges, we can iterate through basically anything that we are allowed to iterate through. So in this case, we want to iterate through our entire collection, and we just want to print out each of the elements in the collection. So we just say for A inside of array any, and then we can just print out that A. And you'll see here that it goes through each of our elements inside of our array and then prints it out. We can also add type annotations to our A here. So if we need to, we can put a type here, and this specific type will be any question mark. I'm not going to go too much into this specific type right now, but we will talk about it in a later video. So as mentioned before, for iterates through anything that provides an iterator. And an iterator is something that has a member or an extension function called iterator, whose return type has a member or extension function of next, and has a member or extension function of has next, which returns a boolean. A for loop over an array is compiled to an index-based loop that does not create an iterator object. If you want to iterate through an array or a list with an index, you can do it by the index. So for instance, if I type in array any dot indices, this will actually loop through our array by index. A will be the index, so to go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. We can take any array and then we can put A inside of it, and now what will happen is it will print out the index and then it will print out that element at the index. So you can see here our first index, which is 0, and then it prints out 12, then for 1 it prints out 2.3, and then for 2 it prints out 45.0, etc. And you notice that these all run together, and that's because we haven't used string integral or added a space. Now, if we want to get both the index and the element of the array in a very easy way, we can use array.any with index, and then we just assign a comma b or whatever we want, with a being the index and b being the value inside of the array. So this is sort of like what we were doing before, except instead of using two print statements, we have one, and we don't have to call array any and then actually put the index in it. And you can see down here that we get 0, 12, 1, 2.3, etc. The next major loop type is a while loop. So this while loop is fairly basic and a lot of languages have while loops. We set up a variable outside of the while loop. I'm setting it equal to five. And then we have while and then a conditional. And while this conditional is true, the while loop will continue to loop. And this will continue to loop until i is less than or equal to zero. So this will go from five all the way down to zero. And you can see here we get five, four, three, two, one, zero. And this is just the very basic way of using while. Now a really useful way of using while loops is with iterators. So we can take an array and then turn it into an iterator. And then we can say while our iterator has a next element, then we want to continue to loop through it. And then we can print out iterator.next, which will be the actual element. So this will go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then null. And as expected, you can see this is the output. And we can expand while loops by doing what's called a do while loop. And we do this if we want to run the code before we exit the while loop. The do part is the part that we're running. And the while loop will end when while actually becomes true. So when the condition is satisfied rather than when the condition is not satisfied. This will wait until y equals null. So until we get to the end of our array, and it will cut off after it prints out null because the do gets run before the while gets checked. So if, for instance, I put in a value 7 here, 7 will not be printed out, but null will still be printed out. And you'll see here we get 1 through 5 and then null, and we do not get 7. Now imagine that we have two loops. So we have two for loops here. Both are iterating from 1 to 100. So this one is iterating from 1 to 100, and then inside of it, it's iterating from 1 to 100. Essentially, between the two, we have a thousand iterations. Then we have an if statement. This is checking to see if j is equal to 50, and when it is equal to 50, then we want to break out to this label. So in other words, this will break out of both loops. Then it will print out our i, and this will never get run. You can see it says unreachable code. So we need to put this print 
LNI above the break statement. And finally, after it breaks, it'll print out break loops. And you'll see here that it goes from one all the way down to 49. And then it prints out I, which is only on its first iteration, and then it breaks the loops. So this is a real easy way to break out of two loops is by using these labels. You could remove this label here and here. And what would happen is it would only break out of the first loop. So you can see here that it actually does iterate from one to 50 a hundred times. And I'm not going to scroll all the way up because there's quite a lot of code here. And then it finally gets out of the loops. So every single time J hits 50, it breaks out of this loop. And then I gets incremented by one. And then it keeps iterating up to 50 again. And then it breaks out and goes ahead, etc. So break statements only break out of the closest loop unless they have a specific label. So we can also use the return keyword to get out of the nearest enclosing function or function expression. In this case, we have an expression called for each. So this is a method on our list of numbers. And we're checking to see if the number that we're iterating through is equivalent to two, in which case we want to print out exit implicit return. And then we want to return et for each. In other words, it will break out of this function and then it will continue. So what will happen is it will print out one, then at two, this if statement will execute and it'll print out exit and implicit return. Then at three, it will go back and start iterating from three all the way up to five. And you can see it goes one and then exit implicit return. And then it goes three, four, and then five. We also have continue statements which allow us to proceed to the next step of the nearest enclosing loop. So these are useful if we want to return from something and then continue based on a conditional. Now this is kind of the same behavior that we just kind of did here. By using this for each, we can go back up to the for each and continue and basically skip one iteration. We can also do an inline return by using a specific label. So rather than just calling for each, we're going to just call in this lit label. So when this conditional actually executes, we will exit out of this for each function. So you can see here it goes from one all the way up to four and then it says exit inline return without printing five. Anyway guys, I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. If you did, feel free to subscribe and like. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the box below. And if you dislike this tutorial, then by all means downvote it as much as you like. Have a good night.